<laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with Calvin, We the Species. Uh, uh, well, by the way, we're uh, chronologically, we're in June, uh, one of my favorite months because it's summer and there's all kinds of songs about summer. So it's summertime. I'm happy. It's, we had a thunderstorm. It's raining. Uh, I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt, no sweater, no sweatshirt. This is great. And, and uh, 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 this is a very special uh, interview with Jennifer Glass. We've been together for a while uh working on some things uh and and i have to give a shout out uh to the universe because i always like connectivities of the universe uh and and also a shout out to to rachel beck who was one of the most amazing personalities that i've ever met who is, his whole life is involved about giving and bringing people together uh and and it was rachel beck who did the initial get together of jennifer and myself to work on projects and 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 maybe Jennifer and I will, will be doing some things beyond the confines uh, of podcasts because I just did her podcast, Mojo. We'll talk about that. Uh, and now she's doing this podcast. Uh, but maybe we'll because we have some. We'll talk about it shortly. You know, we've got some some interest uh, and passions about mental health. Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, it's just part of the whole panoply. It's a great word, panoply of the things that we do. Uh, so there's a, but most importantly, uh, um, Jennifer uh, is a coach, is a business coach, and the word coach is one of the most wonderful words in the human language because it means so much. And she's been doing business coaching, at least I think for 19 years, if I got my numbers right. Uh, so, uh, and and there's so much more to coaching, business coaching, and, and we just said it. I just said it. Before we went on air, uh, there's so many businesses who don't do it right and don't take advantage of a coach like Jennifer. Uh, and it can make a world of difference, a world of difference. The most important aspect of, of business is having a coach and having that direction uh, and not thinking you can do it by yourself. So there's so much there's so much to be uncovered. And to talk about, and and I'm uh, I'm now done with my official Johnny Carson monologue, which had no jokes, uh, and and it is a, a, a huge pleasure, uh, Jennifer, to sit down with you now here. Um, and why don't you do a little uh, intro and some background, and then we'll kind of jump into some stuff. Take it away. Absolutely. And first of all, Cal, thank you so much for having me as your guest. It's great. And like you said, Rachel saw something in both of us and she said, I got to connect the two of them and started with our uh, concern for the climate. But there's definitely a lot more that was there and all of that that eventually brought us uh, to where we are. We're both authors and all of that. So there's so many different similarities uh, from where we are, other than we're both Jersey people. So that's always another big one too. Big one. Um, as for me, um, I am a, uh, like you said, I'm a business coach. I love working with small businesses. And it's funny because I've been accused of being utopian. And when I was accused of being utopian, and I'll explain why in a second, but normally when you're accused of being utopian, there's like a dystopia somewhere. And I was accused of being utopian because I believe that when I can help my clients, I can really have a huge impact on the small business community and the overall community and not just our local community, but our communities as a plural in general, our nation, and not just the United States, but the globe. Because as we can really find those opportunities in business, all of a sudden, these businesses start getting more money. They get more sales. They need to hire more people. Hiring more people, they put people to work. Doing that, they also have more money now coming in that they can give to all of these local organizations that depend on Main Street businesses. They now are getting a benefit. And all of these different things, that's the growth. So being utopian, I'll take it. Okay. Um, the first thing, as you're, uh, the first thing I, I wanted to, you've done uh, work in TV. Uh, I mean, you studied poli-sci, I know that. 
but you've done some work in TV. Uh, anything you wanted to say about that? I mean, I'm a, I'm such a groupie when I hear, you know, TV. Um, it's always, you know, you throw someone as seen on TV or they are on TV. There was something that was really funny. Um, Peter Alexander from NBC News. So he and his sister were on the Today Show uh, for something that his sister is battling. I can't remember the exact disease, but she's basically losing her sight and her hearing. And it's a genetic disease. But he said, I'm the one on TV, but she's the hero. Because we all have that, oh my God, it's the celebrity factor. We just start glomming onto people who are on TV. For me though, um, my role in TV is as an associate producer for America's Real Deal. Um, a lot of us have heard of Shark Tank. We may know Dragon's Den, which is the Canadian version of Shark Tank. Uh, basically what America's Real Deal is, it's similar in the sense that businesses are coming on to get funding, but instead of it being that it's a judge who's giving the funds, America's Real Deal is actually taking the business bringing it to the American public and allowing the John Q public to invest as little as $100 in those businesses. Think about it this way. If you invested $100 in Uber when they first started, how much would that be worth now? A million? It would be worth a ton of money, right? If you have that $100 that you can invest in a couple of different businesses, all of a sudden now, that now allows you in five, 10 years to potentially be having a huge exit when they go public. So that's the reason that America's Real Deal is one of the wow. um, best sources to do this. I mean, there's a lot of, I'll be honest, there's a lot of companies who are helping to do that equity crowdfunding. America's Real Deal is the only one to do it, though, with a TV show. Wow. And so being an associate producer for them, being in that position that we're really trying to get businesses out there. I mean, there was one uh, business here in Bergen County who I was really proud that she uh, saw the value. She has a mobile waxing uh, salon. She goes to you. You don't go to a salon. She comes to you. And she went on the show and she did pretty well. I mean, there's a lot of people that know her, that whole model of how she's going to be growing and everything. A lot of it came because of America's Real Deal and seeing that growth, that's really exciting. Wow. Interesting, interesting. Uh, okay. BGSI Coaching, which is Business Growth Strategies International. You've been doing this for a long, long time. Uh, let's dissect elements of uh bgsi uh part of that is you're a, a business growth uh, architect and and as i and, and you and, and and i pull this out from somewhere you you have the abil ability to to find virtually any small and medium-sized business 10 to 20 10 to fifty thousand dollars in like 45 minutes uh without them spending any money uh i mean that's just uh that's an amazing statement so let's begin with that and, and some of the things you do with BGSI. And by the way, um, and this is interesting because I actually took the time uh, uh, doing my due diligence uh, as a journalist, you know, to look at things. And of course, I, I looked at testimonials and looking at the testimonials, uh, one, um, uh, 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 there was a theme, there was a few themes uh, about you and in fact, you're thorough. But the fact is you, you love to listen. And and uh, and and that's done so little today. So the, the, that that really uh, uh, you know that alerted me. You know that there's something special here, like you. So talk about BGSI, the history, and 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 dissect some of the things you do. Calvin, if I can, I want to go back to that listening piece for a second before I talk about the BGSI side. One of the things that I was fortunate to have done as a volunteer cause for a couple of years was I was chair of the um, local juvenile justice, um, juvenile, juvenile conference committee, um, where basically here in New Jersey, by state statute, there's a group of volunteers in each of the municipalities 
Um, and some municipalities are you know, bundled in with others, but there are a group of volunteers who meet. And for the kids that do, for lack of a better way of saying it, a bozo thing, you know, they're out after dark drinking, they take mom's car for a joyride, they shoplift under $250 because that becomes a felony, uh, things along those lines. In order to keep these kids from being adjudicated against, difference, by the way, adjudicated means they actually appeared in front of a judge and they were found guilty, as opposed to an adult court where it's you're tried. In a juvenile court, it's adjudicated, just that you're understanding the difference for those of you watching and listening. But basically, the idea with the JCC was that during the training, the very first session, we went through a, um, it was a whole big training, but the very first uh, session, they showed the Avenue Costello to West on first get. And because of the listening, right? It's not just what's being said, it's what's not being said to. It's being in a position that you're really listening, active listening as opposed to passive. Too many of us are in that passive waiting for that person to stop talking so we can just jump. It's really listening to what someone is saying because that's when you can really start seeing how you can make a difference. And you're right, there's way too many people who are not doing that. And thank you for bringing that out. Going back to your question now about BGSI and um, what we do. So the other thing you mentioned also is the 10 to $50,000 in 45 minutes without spending additional money on marketing and advertising. So one of the things there I will say is that 10 to $50,000 can be significantly higher for a business who is doing much more in revenue. It just really depends on where the business is. And I threw out the 10,000 because most businesses are around the $7,500,000 mark and not the million, two, three, et cetera. And so there is that difference. What we do though, is we go through a really quick way of looking at your business. We dissect exactly what you're doing. And I have a whole system that for those of you who are a certain age, you may remember the choose your own adventure book. You basically said, I want to go here. All right, turn to page 53. You want to go there, turn to page 82. You want to do this, page 40. Based on how you answer, I have a system that gives me 494 million different ways, and yes, 494 million different ways to help me find those kinds of revenues. It allows me to actually get out there based on the answers that you gave, the way that we need to come up with a roadmap to help you generate those uh, revenue dollars. The other thing that we also wanna pay attention to is you said that without spending money, it's not spending money. It's not spending money on marketing and advertising. That's not working. Okay, so as an example, one of the things that we would look at is, what is your joint venture strategy like? Do you have strategic partners? Do you have partners? Do you know how to actually create them? Do you know how to nurture them? Do you know how to encourage them to keep working with you as you're moving through this? So that's some of the things that we do in that area, just that you understand where that's coming from. But yes, we've got that tool that allows us to really be doing that and then making that difference. And that's why I love being a coach because I really can impact so many people in what they do, how they do. And like I said before, in the utopian side, really see that impact that my clients have when they start getting those additional revenues. And so from that perspective, that's also where the business growth architect comes in because I really look at what it is that you're doing. And if I wanted to start a foundation, right? I build the basement of a house, I'm in the architect, I'm putting the blueprint together and I'm saying, here's your basement, right? Let's get your foundations together. Let's build the first floor, All right? We've got that now. So the foundations is you're clear on the five things you need to be doing every day in your business. Profits, leads, conversions, transactions, and pricing. That, convert, that accounts for 80% of the revenue that you make, All right? Focus on those five things and you're going to be much better off. Then we build the first floor and that's looking, how do we keep taking those five areas and then really solidifying what it is that we need to be doing? And then we keep building up, putting more layers on top of those different areas that we can really see that kind of growth that we're looking for in the business. Wow. Okay. Um, 
there's so much uh some of the services that you provide on I, I took some notes uh marketing uh website these are all things you can chat about it briefly website design development and hosting seo uh social media marketing uh content marketing email marketing i mean there's a ton of things you do which most people don't do most people don't have a coach uh and and you know calling yourself a coach i said this before it, it's one of the highest it's one of the highest things you can do as a human being to coach others in whatever you know i, I coach students and there's nothing quite like it and you're a business coach and and um uh and it's funny uh uh, one of the things that actually depresses me the most, and it, it pertains to you, is I'm driving up the highway and there's a new business. Oh, there's a new business and flowers, uh, rest, whatever. Uh, and you know, three weeks later, I drive by and it's out of business. And and I get really, really depressed when I see that because it, it's somebody's life and dream and hope. And 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 so uh, again, uh, I'm just a lay person here, but I can't overemphasize uh, in my world how important it is to be coached. So so talk about some of those things just briefly. Some of the things you do uh, specifically. Absolutely, and thank you. So the first thing that I will say is I know exactly the feeling. I've seen way too many businesses and in my chamber of commerce role as vice president of my chamber, 13th year already doing it. Uh, but in that role, we've done many ribbon cuttings just to see a few short months later, the business is already on its way out. And it's really heartbreaking when you do see that. There's a couple of reasons. Sometimes they're simply undercapitalized. They don't walk in with the right kind of business plan. They don't walk in with the right kind of funding for their business. They think that the sales are just going to be coming in because they open up and they put a shingle out, whatever it is that you want to call it, and people are going to be walking it off the street. The truth is that we do need to be looking at what the online uh, world is doing as well. I mean, we know Amazon is here to stay. They are not going anywhere. They're the 800-pound gorilla. The question is, though, can you also sell on Amazon? Use the service to take advantage of your own service, too. One of the things, and I'll really show a really easy, quick example here. Many of us have heard of Groupon, right? Groupon is a great place. You want to go experience something, go new things to try, places to eat, whatever it may be. I am using the power of Groupon in my own business, right? I have an e-learning system. I want to get it in front of as many people as possible. I go to Groupon. I'm giving up a way too much uh, for the advertising dollars that I am getting in value, but my information is on Groupon. You go to Groupon, you can find it. And it's a really easy way to have that kind of opportunity. How can you and your business be looking at those online pieces to be really keeping in touch that it's not just waiting for people walking down the street and saying, I'm going to come in and I'm going to stop in at your store. Because the truth is we know people are not going to do that. Unless you're really like, if you're on Fifth Avenue in Midtown Manhattan, you're going to have a lot more people walking down the street. If you're in suburban New Jersey or in suburban USA, you're not going to have as many people walking down the street and just saying, all right, brand new business. I got to go in and check it out. Like you said, Cal, you're driving down the road. At some point, I got to go in. I got to check it out. But it's not right now. And if you remember next week, you'll come in. So that's one thing. Just to keep that in mind. So on the coaching side, that's definitely one of those areas that we are looking at. On the web hosting and development, again, I mean, that's pretty simple. The hosting, um, we have relatively inexpensive plans for most of our hosting. And it's really, it's a commodity. I can price the commodity lower because I'm looking at just how can I work with you? How can I work with them? How can I work with someone else that's going to really be making that difference? That's that. But the development is another piece. And we really also need to understand how a website needs to actually operate and look in order to convert. I don't want to just build a site for the sake of building a site. When we build a site, the whole point is to really get it to a point where understanding 
And again, I get into a fight sometimes. I don't like it that way. I understand you don't like it, but if it's meant to convert or it's meant to look pretty, there's two very different things here. They can be mutually exclusive. They don't have to be, but they can be. And so if someone's desire is, I want it to be the flashiest, prettiest thing that's out there, but written terribly, no clear call to action and all of that that's out there, it's not going to be worth the money that you're paying. And so please pay attention to conversions over uh, aesthetics. That's a major piece that you want to understand. Another thing that we do is we offer review management. If you, Cal, let me ask you, when's the last time that you bought something online without looking at reviews? Last night. Last night, never look at reviews. I just buy it. Okay. I mean, I just, uh, I don't. And you know what? I should. Uh, but, um, but I don't. Uh, and that's probably really bad. I don't. Uh, I mean, sometimes if rarely do I look at reviews, uh, am, am I in the minority? You are definitely in the minority. Okay. I will tell you that there's a statistic that says about 82% of people wow. will go online to look at review wow. to even find the next burrito place that they're going to go to. Wow. Okay. If you look on social media, not social media, you look at the e-commerce sites. When you're looking at buying something, most people are going to look if someone has 400 reviews and it's a 4.3, 4.4 average, someone has 60,000 reviews and the same 4.3, 4.4 average, they're going to go with the 60,000 uh, person to buy from them over the smaller one. Understanding how social proof makes that difference is a really big thing. So we have a program um, in our review management software that actually, depending on the kind of industry that you're in, um, whether it's just regular retail, Google, Facebook, that's perfectly fine. If you're a restaurant, open table is there that you need that. If you're a doctor, ZocDoc, WebMD, Health Grace, things along those lines, those are all places that, and again, Cal, if you're looking for a doctor, I guarantee you're getting recommendations and you're looking at reviews. I do. Right? That's at least one area that you definitely do. I do. I'm very meticulous about doctors and reviews. And, right. where, and where they, uh, I'm a medical snob that way, where they went to school, uh, uh, the whole package. Yes, I, I'm obsessive about that. Look, we only have one life. And if a doctor misdiagnoses, mistreats us, it can really cause a huge problem. And so looking at it from that perspective, there's also those reviews that we have the ability to drive those reviews for the doctors. And so, again, depending wow. on the industry, Verbo, wow. Airbnb, Hotels.com, TripAdvisor, there's a lot of these different platforms that we can uh, get to get these kinds of reviews. Wow. And so we offer that as well. Again, everything that we do as a company is meant to increase leads, revenues, and opportunities wow. so that business owners can actually get that in and stop leaving money on the table. Wow. That's huge. I would have never... It, the whole institution of reviews i would have never even thought about that uh that, that's great stuff jennifer really uh uh thank you truly great stuff and and you know again i'm i'm not um I'm not in business uh but uh just just grasping the stuff you do and and how sophisticated and all the tools that you have to put to use um it, it's a wow um uh, i was fortunate enough uh through the universe and, and rachel and, and meeting you and so you had interviewed me a week or so ago on on mojo uh, the meaning of life and business uh can you talk about that podcast that you do um a little bit absolutely so i have two podcasts yes um the mojo the meaning of life and business one is the one that i interviewed you on and it is a started as a way for me to really connect with more people uh, because of COVID. One of the things that COVID did to us was it really cut us back. It kind of splintered life, if you will, because you have before COVID and after COVID. 
and it kind of defines most of our lives. I don't know about you, Cal, if it's the same, but I know for me, I look at pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, and how everything is different after. And so one of the things that I did was I thought, you know what, I really want to start connecting more with people. And I want to get the positive stuff out there because there's so much that we all have. There's one story, there's one nugget, there's one really juicy piece that you can share. I forget exactly who said it, but so, uh, there's a quote, everybody has a story in themselves for them to tell. And that's exactly what I try and do. And I called it Mojo because I want to get your mojo. I want to get what it is that you're looking at, that you're seeing. And I want to help you translate that to the listeners so that they can say, you know what? Cal did this. Jennifer did this. Simon did that. Jesse did that. Larry did that. All of these different people. I can now look at what did these people do? And what is that nugget that I can glean? And I can say, all right, let me try implementing this in my life, in my business, and see how that's going to have a major impact on me too. And so I've been fortunate. I'm in my uh, fourth season doing it. Wow. And so we start a new season every January. And so if you think we've got about 200 or so episodes that we've recorded, and that's a huge amount of information that is there that you can go, you can listen, you can find those. What is it that this person is saying? And I had people from middle level management to CEOs of companies. Um, and I love finding that story because that's the thing that really translates. And I get asked all the time, what are you looking for? What would make a good guess? And the answer is, I want the people who are really going to have that story and they're willing to share it with me. And I will use my interviewing skills to peel the onion. I'll walk a little bit, peel the onion, walk a little bit, peel the onion a little more and really find what it is that I can get out of you so that I have your mojo and the listeners do too. I I totally enjoyed my my interview with you um, and, and you did uh you did peel my onion you know you did get to the different layers and and then i appreciated that um um and that's why you're here just to kind of return that that favor uh you know home and home like a baseball home and home a basketball football whatever um just take a, a, a deep breath uh i'm gonna go a little bit off topic i forewarned you uh and just one of my favorite questions to ask uh, you don't have to answer it. Uh, you could even answer it with a couple different answers. Uh, but here goes. Um, excluding a family or friends, uh, somebody living or dead you'd like to spend a day with. There's so many different people that you can throw a few, you can throw a few in there if you want. There's no rules. Yeah. So I would certainly love to have a chance to spend a day with um, our, sorry, our founding fathers. Understand what they saw in our country. Again, here in the United States, we take our former government for granted. We take democracy totally for granted. However, the thing that we need to understand is back in 1776, democracy was an experiment. There was no democracy in the world that we can base anything on. And so looking at what they saw and how they were looking at it, putting aside, you know, three fifths of a man, whatever, I'm not getting involved with that, but how they saw the United States being an entity, being the example to the rest of the world as a democracy would definitely be one of the things that I would certainly love to um, have that opportunity to talk with them figure out what their mojo was to be uh, doing this experiment that we call democracy great answer great answer it's funny i i sometimes when i asking you and i ask guests that that question i always i change my mind but one of my top listed is george washington um 
just to to get into the head and and uh but anyway uh great answer uh Thank moving you. on moving on you are uh a, an author uh and uh i have two of the copies and well, actually one is behind you uh the one i don't have but the building a winning mindset right here and it's the bottom line that matters right here and you can hold up uh, and, and that's one I have to get. So you've written uh, three books. How about talking about Jennifer uh, as an author? Absolutely. And I will say actually that this one in particular, I actually niche down. So it's another one. So this one is um, overall marketing tips. The other one that I niche down was for healthcare businesses. Okay. So okay. how um, healthcare offices can do marketing specific to um, healthcare. But in terms of doing these books, and I'm in the process of writing a couple more business books as well as a thriller, um, I am out there. And again, one of the things that I completely realize is I can only talk to so many people. I can help so many people. A book can help even more. Some people may be too embarrassed to say, you know what, I don't even want to reach out because I can't afford it. But I can go to the library and I can get the book. One of the things that I did when this book first came out, I went to the library in my town and I said, I'm donating three copies of my book to the library. Because I knew that throughout the entire Bergen County, New Jersey library system as the Bergen County Cooperative Library System, that my books are now going to be able to circulate around all of those, what is it? I think it's like a hundred libraries that are in that system. Wow. And so if somebody is looking for a business skill, business building book, they can get my book. And it's an opportunity for them to get the kind of help that they may need that they may not have otherwise had if they don't have access to it. And so that was one of the things that I said I got to do. And I knew I, I happen to be close with the executive directors of uh, the TNEC library. I've been close with them already, three directors now. And so just being in a position to connect with them, that's really important. But again, I want to impart what I can and understanding how I can only have so much of a reach one-to-one -one or even in a group, but how can I get even more like that? And on the novel side, that's going to be a really interesting one and keep an eye out um, because according to a publisher that I've been speaking with, it may even have the power based on just talking about it to be optioned into content. Wow. So that would be pretty interesting. That's great. That's great. It's funny. Uh, um, for some strange reason, I have no, uh, I have no clue. I was talking to um, a friend of mine, uh, last week and she's a former librarian and she has access to all these and, and she we were talking about my novel uh, mm -hmm. there's a tortoise in my hair uh which is kind of new and 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 um she went in and in the only library system right now that has it is bergen county cooperative library and i don't know how uh, i certainly had nothing to do with it but it's up there in bergen county and i gotta i gotta kick out of that okay uh Kind of winding down, uh, you, you, you've been, I uh, uh, heard you say, at least uh, 13 years with the Teaneck Chamber of Commerce. So some of your experiences doing that kind of civic work, which is great work to be involved in that. Absolutely. And one of the things that I will say is I was taught by both my parents that you have to give back. And I've been teaching my kids the same leading by example. The community gives you so much. Sometimes you need more help. Sometimes you need less help. But the community gives you the help. You need to do what you can to really be giving back. In addition to being um, on the chamber board, I'm also on a couple of other boards and commissions. And um, I mentioned the juvenile conference committee that I was part of till I moved and wasn't eligible to serve anymore. Uh, but I was um, over there, and uh, I'm also a volunteer. A pro bono mentor for businesses. So at any given time, I have about six uh, pro bono mentees that I'm working with. 
So there's a lot there that I'm doing also just in terms of trying to really be making a difference and giving back any way that I can. Okay. Uh, okay. Now just to kind of lighten, we've been down um, uh, the yellow brick road of uh, a somewhat heaviness, but I always like to lighten things up. Uh, random of uh, some of your favorite movies. All right now I have follow, 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 follow the yellow brick road stuck in my head. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. Um, so, I mean, my favorite movies, you know, I'm going to say the big chick flicks. I am a sucker for the rom-coms and chick flicks. Um, Love Actually, The Notebook. Um, those are definitely some of them. Um, I mean, Casablanca, and I know your love for Casablanca. Yeah. yeah. I only saw it once, but it was definitely a really good movie um in terms of you know the acting and i mean the lines are so memorable here's looking at you kid um start of an you know what is it um here's the start of a no i'm killing the the beautiful friendship yes um thank you and so i mean a lot of those you know that are there and um you know anything dealing with espionage is another big one um i mean my mind espionage i can immediately get there and boom okay it's funny castle Bica, i went to europe a few summers ago um nine ten hours and uh whatever uh i, I watched castle Bica twice on the airplane going and twice more coming home so that brings me up to about 150 times i've watched that movie um interesting uh, it uh it was written by the Epstein brothers, uh, and it took them about four days to do that script with a couple of, you know, a couple of updates, and, and they almost uh, they almost went improv. I mean, I've read so much stuff about uh, Castle Blanco, but anyway, um, all right, uh, semi serious. Uh, your your take on on climate change, which is one of the things that drew us together. Uh, your take on that? Do you worry about it? So I will say that there's way too many people that still fight the idea that there is climate change. And I will tell you that looking at the weather patterns, looking at the storms, looking at the fires, looking at everything, there is no way, scientifically speaking, that we can say there is no climate change happening. We've seen, if you look at the last couple of weeks, I mean, the amount of tornadoes that have been coming, uh, going back at least 200 years. And unfortunately, we can't say what happened a thousand years ago just because the information is not there. But if you look at the last, you know, give or take, um, what is it? I think it's 1860 is when we started keeping uh, weather records. If you go back for those 164 years, if you look at the number of tornadoes that strike in the United States, they are way lower than what happened. The month of April alone, I think, saw over 400 tornadoes. There's no way that we can say when the average was 200 that there isn't climate change happening. We need to really understand how things are going to be impacting us long term. I don't know exactly how different programs that the government is suggesting is going to be making a difference. As an example, Cal, if it's okay, I'm going to get really controversial here for a second. Um, but one of the things the government is saying they want, as an example, all schools and public buildings here in New Jersey anyway, to go electric uh, heating and everything. While that sounds great because you're taking the gas and all of that stuff out of the equation from burning it to create that, you're necessitating the power plant burning that gas instead to create the energy that is now being used to heat the building. So you're taking, what is it? You're paying Peter, to, no, borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. And how are you really changing the way that that's being looked at? I mean, the electric vehicle market, that's another great idea in theory, but I heard, and again, I have to double check the validity but I heard that it takes much more to actually charge a car than the amount that it's going to be um, just burning on gas. If you look at what you're doing, that it takes more energy to charge your car than you can char run an entire house. 
for 24 hours. And so if you look at it in that perspective, are we really doing anything for the environment or are we kind of whitewashing because we want to be politically correct and say, we're going to do this for the environment. I'm more focused on actual substantive change. I have a program that I am trying to do. And Rachel is uh, kind enough to be working with me. And Cal, I think you and I certainly spoke about it as well. Um, cannot get into it here just because I was advised until there is a patent on it. Do not uh, mention it elsewhere. But um, this kind of an idea, there is definitely that possibility to have substantive change. And it's not the kind that's going to be, let's put different gas to run instead of just doing it how we're doing it. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, I always like to do this too. Uh, uh, I've been doing uh, so many interviews and asking people how they feel about AI. Uh, positive, negative, not sure. Um, are, are you a fan of AI? So let me first say this. AI is here and it's here to stay. Okay, one of the things that, and I kid around um, sometimes when I say, I need to say hello, please, and thank you, because you never know what's going to happen. I talk with my uh, personal assistant. I'm not going to say her name because she'll start talking over me, uh, but I'm probably one of the few people who say please and thank you to her. And then she tells me, uh, you're... Um, your appreciation gives me such a charge, something like that. You know, one of those things or a, a whole bunch of funny ways of responding. But the idea about AI is that there's so many things that it can really be good for and a whole bunch of things that it can really be detrimental for. One of the things that we saw in the, I think it was the Mexican election, was the use of deep fakes. There was a report on NBC News where uh, Janice Mackey Fryer was down in Mexico and she was talking with someone and uh, there was one candidate running whose deceased father came back from the grave to endorse his son on AI. Yeah. They used a deep fake. They had a photo of him. Wow. They got him to talk and everything. A lot of people simply forgot that he was dead, wow. but he was back from the grave and he was endorsing his son. He held the seat uh -huh. before. His son was running for the seat now, and he's endorsing his son. Wow. So looking at how AI can really be a potential detrimental effect to the political system is definitely going to be something that we need to really see how can we look at things. On the medical side, we've seen tremendous increases in AI's ability to look years out at somebody's scan and say, this is an area of concern in five years. So if you have a chest CAT scan as an example, and they're concerned that you may be a borderline high risk for lung cancer, and they put it through the system, they can find potential within five years where they need to be watching a particular area of concern. And that's something that AI is really an incredible value because if you think about where we were just a few years ago, that yeah. didn't exist. Yep, yep. Uh, just to to take off, uh, uh, I uh, I remember growing up, we we had the scourge of polio, and it took about thirty years for Salk to come up with a vaccine, and and then we had COVID, and it took a year to come up with a vaccine because they they used AI and they used RNA, and that's how they attacked COVID using uh, RNA. So uh, it 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 boggles the mind with the opportunities. Um, it's funny, I, I read a book uh, by Miss Yukaku, The Physics of the Future, uh, and, and the, what resonated with me the most is down the road 10 or 15, 20 years ago, and he wrote this like 10, 12 years ago, but uh, before the the promulgation of all this AI stuff, but uh, there's a, a picture of the future, there's a guy shaving, looking in the mirror, and he's shaving uh, in 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 the mirror and in the wallpaper around the mirror, there are little cells that are looking into his body. And while he's shaving, thirty years down the road, uh, that those those little cells, photographic cells, are looking, and they find one cancer cell. 
in his body and they immediately alert him and he goes to the doctor and they in inject uh, this one little thing and it finds that one cancer cell and kills it. So that's down the road. Anyway, the last thing, uh, the last thing, uh, we could probably talk for a long time, which is good, but we won't, but it's good. Uh, and that's why uh, I'm going to ask you to come back and uh, whenever and however and whatever shape, way, form we we do other things. But you and I have a a, a common um, uh, interest uh, on on the state of mental health, and we may actually be collaborating on that. So just a couple of words on 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 mental health and how we all need help. Well, Without a question, thank you and. Mental health is one of those things, if you go back a couple of years, it was a major stigma. Nobody wanted to admit they were in therapy. Nobody wanted to admit they needed help. One of the things that we saw was even with PTSD, there were so many people, I think it was the New York City Police Department, so many of the cops were killing themselves because of the troubles that they were having on the job. Way too many people are facing mental health crises, and we need to be helping more people constantly help figure out how to cope with where they are, and not only cope, but thrive. One of the problems that we have is there's still a lot of stigma attached that you're weak if you're seeing a therapist, that you needed help. We have to break that down. We have to really start saying there's so much more that we can do. And the other thing that I just have to uh, do, just because I mentioned um, the crisis, and I would be remiss if I didn't take this PSA opportunity. If you're here in the United States, 988 is the crisis helpline. 988 at any time, call, text, they're available 24 7, 365. If you need someone, they're available to help you. And never be afraid to reach out. Way too many people have left us way too early because of their inability to reach out for that helping hand. And whether it's Cal, it's me, or 988, or whoever else you've got in your life, we're here for you. Great. That was great. Jennifer, thank you. We've come to the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was great. Uh, and, and I'm kind of swimming with input and, and stuff that you've said, and it's all stuck up here. Uh, so uh, officially inviting to come back, like I said, any shape, way, form, panels, discussions. You and I will continue to, to talk about mental health and, and work with, uh, with Rachel. Uh, but thank you so much for your graciousness and your time, and your energy, and your knowledge on, on coaching stuff. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me here. And the one thing I would just want to add is if there's anything that you got from tonight's or today's uh, episode, please, please, please take action. It's not enough to just listen and write down or put it like you said up here. You need to take action. The only way that you can actually start changing is when you take that first step. When you get out of your comfort zone, that's when you can change. And you need to start by taking action. Right. You know, when a rocket ship, you know, uh, Boeing just lost that launch. When a rocket ship takes off, the most amount of energy expended is 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 to lift it a foot in the air, just to get it up and and start moving and, and you know get the uh, the inertia, the energy mm -hmm. up. So that's what you just said. Take action to just begin that process. That's exactly what you said. Thank you, Absolutely. Jennifer. Thank uh, you. I'm going to stop recording. Don't leave. We'll do a two-minute wrap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.